Welcome to Metaphysical Soul Speak. I'm your host, Elena Fox Starks. Hey guys, I hope you're doing really well in this moment in time and that whenever and wherever you happen to be on this spiral matrix, this interdimensional spiral matrix, I hope that you are at this time able to reevaluate and discern your friendship goals at this time. My uh, son and I have been talking about friendship for a couple days now about how easy it is when we're kids. You, you see a kid that's about your height and age and you say, hey, let's be friends. And that kid says, Okay, fine by me. Boom, you're friends. And then when we're adults, it gets so freaking complicated. Does it not? You know, it's so hard to meet people that you love, let alone like. It's hard to meet people that have similar interests, similar attitudes, similar political or religious beliefs and you can have friends that have all the you know other things you know opposite of you but you have to have some things in common to have that bond I have um, several friends that uh, are very very Christian evangelically so and I've got friends that are uh, Jewish a lot of Jewish friends actually lots of Muslim friends You know, so it's okay with me for not having everyone's religion in common, obviously. And I have friends that actually vote Republican all the time. But we have other things in common. Uh, I don't vote Democrat, by the way, just for the record, FYI. I've always voted Green, except for Obama in his second election. And I believe maybe in the beginning, possibly... I might have voted for Bill Clinton. But other than that, I've never voted Democrat as far as the presidency goes. You know, but I've had very, very conservative friends and very, very liberal friends. But there's always been something else, kind of like a bond that comes from beyond. That's kind of not really explainably... Um, it's not explainable. It's not easily explainable. It's not uh, something that you could put a finger on usually. But there always seems to be an energy there, a spiritual energy that surrounds the people who I've been long term friends with. The people who I knew would always be like uh, the do or die, have my back kind of friends and those people in my life have all died Um, it's kind of a symptom of getting older is all the people you know die eventually (laughs) you know um, I have a few other friends that, that I've had for long term friendships but you know my best friend of 30 something years um you know, it's over. I just, I did just get an email from a friend of mine, Gina Marie, who I've known, well, since the nineties, you know, so that's a good long time as well. And uh, I think I met her in 1990, 
one, maybe 1992. So it's it's been quite a while. <laughs> and also my friend Melanie from that same, uh, we all graduated together with degrees in psychology from the Cal State Northridge. So <clears throat> with our, you know, undergraduate degree. And uh, we're all different. We're all very different people, but we all just love each other so much that I probably just because we went through the hard, I mean, we went through a lot of hard stuff in college. Not only the, like the rigors of like getting a higher education, but we all had uh, individual things to overcome. Uh, m- for me, it was massively uh, just huge problems with my health. Um, I almost died <laughs> before I... Uh, got out of college I got very very sick Uh, I picked up a virus that was meant to be uh, biological warfare um, from an army base and uh, I don't want to talk about too much but that's not the scope of this discussion but um but we all had our things and and uh, Melanie didn't believe me we almost we had a falling out because she thought I was lying because I had so much energy followed by zero energy for a couple years (laughs) And then she got sick with something similar. And then she believed me again. She's like, you're a witch. I'm like, I'm not. It's just your karma for judging me so harshly, you know. But uh, we always had weird things like that with us. But but Gina Marie, what a sweetheart. You know, really wonderful person. And I'm still friends with these people. And I will always be friends with them. Um, I have a lot of friends like that, you know. Like, they've never really, like done me wrong or stabbed me in the back and you know Melanie and I had our, a few moments where we just had a f- falling out and we did have a really big falling out that I didn't understand what was happening you know like I didn't understand why why she wouldn't talk to me for years and then when we finally um started talking again she was really embarrassed by it but she said you know me I'm like a really strong independent woman and I got married and he was abusing me like from day one. And when I broke up the friendship, it wasn't me that broke it up. It was him using my email account. And then I was like blocked and it was just like, oh my God. So, cause she didn't, he didn't want her to blab to me that he was an abuser. And you know, I'm not, it's not, it's not for me to t- tell the rest of her story, but suffice to say, she's no longer with him. Thank you, God. Yes. She's got her fur babies and she's living her di- her life day to day. She overcame cancer, you know, so, but, I, but we're, and we're back as friends again. And Tommy, my little childhood friend, I've known him since the, pretty much the day I was brought home from the hospital. We've been in, we were inseparable until about maybe nine or 10 when I moved away from the neighborhood. Uh, you know, so like for 10 years of our lives, we were like best friends, <laughs> climbing trees and jumping rope and trying to learn how to ride a bike and, you know, all those kinds of things. But everything is easier when you're younger, you know, and when you're in university, it's easier to make friends. And then when you're an adult, you just kind of seem to attract your dysfunction, <laughs> You just attract your mirrors. You just attract the people that have similar shit that you have, or they might have the opposite stuff, you know, but then you get to see who you are and test your mettle. You know, you meet people who you feel sorry for, so you want to help them. And then they take advantage of you and they ask you for too much money or they will, um, just drain you dry, you know, like fricking money vampires, you know, like for real, they'll, um, take advantage to until you're practically dead and they don't care. A lot of people in the world like that, you know, um, I've, I've heard of many stories, you know, with, uh, people that have been this way, you know, and it's really hard to, especially if you're an empath and if you're a light worker, you know, you, you shine bright like a light, but you attract a lot of moths. <laughs> You know, you're not attracting other lights, usually. Uh, Mostly because we're here to heal all these people that are so broken and so 
fucked up that they don't know how to formulate normal, healthy adult relationships. But the way that I look at it now is that the time for all that crap has passed. And somebody did request today that I include in my list of hypnosis um, audios that I'm getting ready to record. One in which we will stand strong and confident in our person and only attract the people that are now good for us. You know, we've all attracted the narcissistic people, the sociopaths, hopefully not the psychopaths, but there are (laughs) our fair share of those in the world that have brushed elbows with us and they're not friends. You know, they're not friends at all. They're just people that want to take advantage of us nice guys. So, um, I think it's time that we reevaluate all of our priorities in our friendships. It's time to do a little bit of house cleaning, you know, sweep the cobwebs from our mind and (laughs) sweep the people who've left way the hell too much debris there in our mind in our house mind <laughs> you know if you put you put it like your house is I mean your mind is like a big house how many people are lingering in there that don't belong anymore how many people don't really fit you know you know I, I've had my share of friends over the years that I didn't fit with you know like I didn't get their sense of humor or I didn't uh, like their sense of humor or, you know, just things that just like, I love them. I love them so, so much, but I just, after a while, just have to let them go because, you know, it's just like things weren't fitting, you know? And part of me felt sad by, by that because I really love these people. I had some friends that were what I consider to be very neat people very cool, interesting, creative, but literally nothing in common, you know, and I've had other friends that I had stuff in common with, but I couldn't hang with their personality or I couldn't hang with their, um, bathroom humor. I had one friend who thought it was hilarious to eat a very gassy meal and then go to like target and fart her way down, up and down the aisles, laughing her head off. And I mean, but just disgusting. It was so loud and so stinky. I couldn't even be near her. I'd be like, so I'd be like dying. A thou- I'd be like turning a thousand shades of red, dying of embarrassment. Like, God, I'm a Virgo. You don't do that shit around a Virgo. Really? You just don't. You just don't, you know, like <clears throat> you don't lift up yourself off a chair to make it louder on purpose and then laugh your head off in a restaurant, but she did that sitting right next to me. And I just, I just, I I just freaked out one day. I was like, I can't, I can't even be around this anymore. You know, I just can't, I love you. You're a good friend, but I I can't handle that shit anymore. I really, it just freaks me out. I just (laughs) know. And she's like, do you want me to hold it inside my body? I'm like, I want you to get up, walk to the bathroom, have your moment there, and then come back as if nothing happened, like a normal fucking human being, <laughs> like a polite adult who was raised with manners. You know, this is, this is what, is, is, is it too much to ask that you, you, you don't act like Ren and Stimpy in your day to day, right? I just, blah, I couldn't and hang with that. <laughs> and, um, I've had friends dump me for like crazy reasons that just didn't make any sense to me. I had a friend that just out of nowhere, she just hadn't talked to me in years. We finally get back in touch. And the first thing she said is she, she said, I want to know what I'm doing wrong as a friend. And I told her like six things, <laughs> Virgo, you don't ask a Virgo unless you really fucking want to know. <laughs> and I told her and she said, well, but that's not really what I'm asking. I'm like, okay, well, I don't understand. What do you want me to say? You know? 
And she all of a sudden, she just freaked out on me. And she said, that's it. We can't be friends anymore. And then she said a few very judgmental things about how I was living my lifestyle. And um, how I wasn't making my own money. And I was like, dude, you know, the condition of death benefits from Social Security in the United States is that you don't. If you work, you lose all the money. And the problem was I would have had to make double or triple how much money it was in order to keep only like a little bit less money that was, does that make sense? So like if it say it was $2,000, I'd have to make $6,000 to make ends meet and maybe take home 1500 at the end of the day because of all the insurance, all of the, the bills, um, tutors for the children, nannies for the children, like the whole nine yards. Like it would have been stupid for me to go work. 60 hours a week and never see my children. So, I mean, my choice was to, Hey, it's travel the world on a shoestring budget and have fun. We can live in hostels. We can rent apartments, you know, and we can learn uh, Spanish, <laughs> you know, and my, my oldest kid automatically got like three or $4 more an hour for being fluent in Spanish. You know, it's just, I'm like, I'm going to give you guys some lifelong skills and um, experience that no one else has. It'll give you an advantage in every job interview. You know, not only do I know Spanish, I know countries, six different countries, cultures, you know, and I could relate to anybody, you know, that are, you know, in, in basically in California, you know, most, more or less, you know, but, um, if I had a friend who freaked out on me because she judged me for that. I'm like, well, that's what I wanted to do. You know, she's like, well, you're living off of a man's money. It's like, I'm being paid what I, what is owed me because my husband left the world too soon. And my life that I loved so much is gone, you know, and I paid my dues. I was married to this guy 13 years, you know, (laughs) It wasn't all about paying the dues, but I mean, that's what it ended up in the end being, you know, I, I earned that money <laughs> being a stay at home wife and mother for 13 years. And, uh, and I was able to continue it. So for 23 years, actually I've been officially out of the career job market, you know, although I worked, I did work while we were married, but, um, but she judged me for all that. So, and that was like crazy. It was like, do I really, so I have to evaluate, do I want to be with somebody who or friends with somebody who's going to judge me for the lifestyle choices I made because they weren't her choices. She chose to be single her whole adult life and not have children. And I always wanted to be married and have children. And she even judged um, our mutual friend who got married and had children as well. So you have to reevaluate everything in your friendships at this time. It feels like this is the time, you know, do you want to be uh, friends with people who are, um, they don't have to be the same as you. They could be, uh, you know, you could have, you know, people of all religions that doesn't matter or even other political viewpoints. That's okay. As long as they treat you with love and they treat you with respect and they, um, choose to accept you even if your lifestyle choices are different than theirs and if they choose to just love and honor and respect you no matter what you're going through I had <clears throat> friends that dropped me like a hot potato <laughs> the very second my marriage started to unravel and fall apart as if it was a disease they could catch. Divorce is not a virus, right? I wasn't even being negative about it. I was sad about it. I was heartbroken over it, but I wasn't saying he's a this and he's a that. I wasn't, I'm not that kind of person. Even during the divorce, I honored and respected my guy, you know, and there were, there were times I was really angry. Like, you know, he's acting this way and I don't get it. (laughs) you know, he had brain cancer and he became very violent. It was out of nowhere, you know, and I didn't find out until 
10 days before he died, nine months after the divorce. So, I mean, for a couple of years, he was acting kind of crazy out of nowhere. It was a very confusing time for the kids and me. But, um, but during that time, I, I found out who my true friends are. You know, when you are happy and your life is going well and you've got friends and then your life starts to fall apart and unravel, suddenly your friends have a million things that are uh, better to do than spend an hour on a Saturday with you. Then you know they're not your friends. They're not your true friends. You know? When the going gets tough, if uh, your friends get going, (laughs) then they're not your friends. But when the going gets tough and and your um, friends hang tough with you, those are the people that are going to be your friends for the rest of your life. I had a friend who, um, she had gone through a divorce while I was, she's going through it um, right after I met her. And we stayed friends and we got together and talked and she would, you know, bitch and moan about her husband a little bit here and there. And then we would go on to a different topic and that was okay. And then when I went through my divorce, she was there for me. And up until very recently, we were talking pretty often. And I think I I just have a weird feeling that she might have died because there's no reason or no way she would not have gotten back to me. Because she was one of those friends. I was one of her very few friends that could handle the fact that her son was very autistic. And um, he was a lovely child. But every now and again, when one of my kids gave him a piece of gum or something accidentally, <laughs> he wasn't as lovely. you know. But most of her friends couldn't handle when he acts out. you know. And it was my kid's fault for, oh, here's a piece of gum. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. He's not supposed to have sugar <laughs> because you can, you can help autism with uh, changing diet quite a bit. And, um, we didn't know, we didn't think about it. You know, for us, it was just a normal thing. And I think maybe he ate a cookie or something. I think one of my kids said, oh, I think my daughter gave him a, a, like a little bit of an Oreo or something. Oh boy, that was a long ride home. <laughs> you know, like a, a four or five hour ride home. It felt like a three day ride home, (laughs) you know, but, but I still loved her. I was still her friend. She was still my friend, you know, like everything was, um, cool, copacetic as my stepdad always says, you know, because we still had that honor and that love for each other. And even years after we met, we still had things about each other that we were discovering, which was incredible. I loved that. It takes years to get to know somebody, not just, hey, you want to be my friend? Boom, we're friends. Now you know everything. You know, that it's not really how it works when you're an adult. It takes a while to trust somebody enough to bring up some of your deeper stuff, right? Um, and sometimes you just don't talk about your past that much. You know, like you don't talk about, you know... Um, old jobs it used to have and turns out they had a similar job you know like you might find out something about someone like six seven eight years later you know and and um I love that kind of discovery like no way it's weird we had that in common this whole time didn't even know you know you know because you you tend to talk about just day-to-day things or whatever but whatever kind of friends I mean you can have friends that are um deeply spiritual and you can have another group of friends that are your, your, you know, the gossiping ninnies, (laughs) you know, you people you just hang out with and talk about this, talk about that, talk about fashion, talk about celebrities, talk about the weather, talk about the shallow shit in life, which can be super, super fun. Let's go out and have a yogurt. Let's go out and have a light lunch and a yogurt and maybe we'll do aerobics together or whatever. You know, you can have those friends that are just kind of like you're, you know, they'll be there for you if they, if you need, or you'll be there for them, but it's all very shallow overall and that's okay. And then you can have your super deep philosophical friends that you call at midnight and you stay up till six in the morning talking about the state of the world, you know, and what if extraterrestrials are real and what if they come, you know, those kind of deep conversations, you know, but I think it's a time now that we need to reevaluate 
and not just stick with our friends out of nostalgia's sake if they're not really um, honoring and respecting us. It's it's okay if you have nothing in common with people, but you know if you love them and you want it and you enjoy their company and they enjoy your company, that's cool. You know you find one or two things you have in common, and you know I had a friend that um, he and I hardly had anything in common, but we made it a point to get together and go hiking uh, once a week while I was going through the divorce, and you know and we didn't talk about it that much. He told me I could if I wanted to, but we'd just usually go skip stones at the river you know, kick it, hang out, you know, we'd go meet at a Mexican restaurant. Sometimes we'd watch movies in the park, you know, um, we'd go watch fireworks together because neither one of us had anybody, um, special to watch fireworks with several 4th of July's in a row. So he's like, Hey, let's go burn. Let's go blow shit up. Oh yeah. I love that. (laughs) Let's go eat a bunch of fireworks. That's so fun. That's like one of my favorite things in the world just blowing shit up. It's super fun. I'm like a, a, I'm a little, um, teenage boy inside, (laughs) you know, quite often. And and that's one of the ways I love blowing stuff up, but, um, (laughs) and and screaming at the top of my lungs. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, not every day, but I mean, it's, it's, I have time. I have fun. I have fun times sometimes, but, um, I don't know. You have to, reevaluate all the things, all the way that the ways that people treat you. Like this one person who was judging my lifestyle, um, for years, our friendship was super one-sided where she would, she would call me and tell me all of her problems almost every night. And then when I'd be like, yeah, I'm going through a few things. She'd go, Oh, I gotta go. And that'd be it. It's like, Shh, Wow. And when I flipped the script finally, and I started saying, I need to talk about my stuff now. She's like, okay, that's fine. And then she just started coming all unglued. And that's when the friendship kind of, that's why we didn't talk for a few years because she couldn't handle that. I flipped the script on her and I wasn't her free therapist anymore. You know, so if people are using you for your free advice, your free therapy, your listening ear, and, you know, and you can't hang with that anymore. It's time to cut those apron strings, cut those purse strings if they're asking you for money as well. I mean, thank God that friend of mine, she was a millionaire. Actually, she didn't um, ask me for money. I never asked her for money, you know, so that wasn't our thing. But before she became a millionaire, she was eating my food a lot, but that was just her personality. Oh, are you going to eat that? And like grabbing it, taking a bite before I could say no. Or for it to say, yes, I am eating. I'm in the middle of eating that. <laughs> you know, having a battle of forks at the table, you know. <laughs> She's stabbing my food. I'm stabbing her hand. I'm just kidding. Never got that far. But <laughs> but we, um, we all have at this time to just really maybe write a list of, in, in general, what, how do you want to be treated? What did you always want in a friendship? I mean, do you ever watch TV shows or movies where there are people who are friends? They might have issues. They might have problems with each other. They might have instances in the past, but they still really love each other. Have you ever seen those kind of shows? And a part of you just kind of dies a little inside because you've never had that. Or have you ever um, watched like, if you're a woman and you watch sex in the city and how close these women, they're so totally different from each other, but they're just so close. You know, they're really there for each other. And I loved that. I love shows like that because it shows me that there's a possibility of having that eventually. I don't know if it's going to happen at this late date. You know, I've had my moments in life where I had people like that you know, where they were like do or die, you know, just felt like there's no way I would never not talk to this person like forever. You know, I had one friend that was like that. Um, we were like sex in the city. It was just like constantly laughing, constantly joking. Just we do shallow stuff together. We then, but we would have deep philosophical conversations, 
you know, we would opt to spend the night talking with each other all night and ignoring our boyfriends, you know, just, we want to hang out together instead. You know, we had that girlfriend relationship and, um, she got twisted up in drugs for a while and I, I couldn't hang with that. You know, I'm like, I need you to not be on drugs. I need you to not do this to your mind. And she started getting into the really, really hard drugs. And it was like all the time. And to the point where our mutual friends were calling her a coke whore. And I'm like, well, I don't, I can't even see that. You know, that she would, and they're like, no, she started having sex for drugs. And I'm like, that's not her. That's not her personality. You know, so several times I tried to intervene. I tried to get her family to intervene and it wasn't working. I'm like, I can't be your friend until you're not this. You're not in this stage of your life anymore. Yeah, I did that tough love thing. I've had to do that a few times. Usually the people come back around, actually, when they're clean and sober. I've had several friends that came back around clean and sober. After I said, I don't, I love you so much, but I can't. I can't watch you destroy your life like this. If you're not going to listen to my advice about it, I can't hang. You know, so you have to, you know, evaluate, you know, like, do you have friends that are addicts and they want you to be the enabler? And they put you in that bad, that, that totally screwed up position. Maybe you don't want that anymore, you know? So maybe you should write a list of things that, you know, uh, you need. What do you need in your relationships and your friendships? You know, um, my son and I were also talking today about, uh, it's really hard when people want to be your friend and they're not um, understanding the world the way you do and you have like zero in common with them and they're very nice but it's so fucking boring for you because you don't relate to anything they say and they're getting a great deal of um, insight and you know your intelligence is higher at a higher level than theirs. And I've had, I've had friendships like that where I'm friends with them and they're getting a lot more out of the relationship than I am where I'm like literally bored to tears. I'm bored out of my mind, but I'm there to help them. And I kind of feel like I'm a guide. I'm a teacher. I'm a, you know, and I kind of, I got tired of those, those kind of really weird lopsided relationships. So for me on my list, I would write no more lopsided relationships. If I, if I have jack shit in common with you, I'm not going to really have that conversation or any conversations. Like I don't freaking have time anymore for that shit. I just don't, you know, I'm not gonna be that rude, but that's, you know, it's kind of, I, I just, I need to limit that. You know, I want to talk to people who want to change the world. People who are interested in having businesses that are spiritually based and it doesn't have to be like a new age bookstore spiritually based, but I know people that have normal businesses, but they want to grow them so big that 90% of their income is given away to, um, charities that are helping children or women or people that are poor, you know, learn a new trade or whatever, you know, like those are the kind of people that I like. They have that, that spiritual intent behind everything they're doing even if it's just making extension arms for forklifts, you know, it could be something that's kind of boring, but maybe they're giving massive amounts of money to charity and they're gathering up all the money. So we can have family reunions or, or, um, you know, or whatever. I had actually the forklift extension thing. That's my cousin, Marilyn, God rest her soul and her husband's soul. They, they both died within a year of each other. And they were very much in love. And I, I actually did tell a story about it last year. Her last words to him were, would you shut the fuck up already? <laughs> and he was coughing. They were both sick. They both had cancer. They thought for sure they're going to die of cancer. And he died of pneumonia instead. <laughs> and that was her last words to him. She said, I know he died just to fucking spite me. She was so mad. She was mad about it, laughing her ass off. But they're probably just having wild parties up in heaven together. Very sweet, very funny, hilarious people. <laughs> but, um, 
but I don't know. I just want you guys to think about it. Just think about all the things that, you know, do you deserve to have a friend that, um, if you really need them, they're there for you at three in the morning. Not that you would ever take advantage, but if you really needed it, you know, if you were diagnosed with a dreaded disease and you're all alone, would they be the one that would be holding your hand? you know, when you're getting dialysis or the cancer treatments? Or would they be the one to disappear? You know, you need the person that's not going to disappear. You know, you need the one who's going to honor and love and respect you. You know, and when you tell them, I have to go to bed now, I'm tired, they're not going to call you an hour later knowing that you're in bed. You know, like someone who's going to respect your boundaries of your time. You know, So you need someone to respect all your boundaries. Even if you have nothing in common, you can have deep, philosophical, great, amazing, and, you know, conversations with people, you know. So no more lopsided relationships. Make these a priority. uh, No more relationships in which you're the doormat that has to listen to all their problems. Or you're the money banks, you know. Even, you know, you're working your ass off and they don't have a job and they keep asking to borrow your car, borrow your money. Can you give me 20 bucks for gas? Maybe I could come over, you know, at, you know, at five o'clock, you know, it's supper time, right? When they know you've got supper on the table for you and your kids, you know, like, do you really need friends like that? You know, mooching, Mr. Mooches, you don't need people like that. So this is the time yesterday we're talking about spiritual goals now. Tonight we're talking about friendship goals. I don't know if we're going to continue this goal-oriented discussion, you know, every day this week for a different thing. We might, but this is what came up today for me. And, um, you know, I think about my friends that I just love that I, that they've gone and I really, really miss, you know, um, I had friends that I met on the phone and we never met like, or we met online And then we met, um, like talked on the phone a lot and never met each other in person that died. I had friends like that, that died. It was crazy. Like it was so strange. All I knew of them was I had a couple pictures of them and I had their, um, their voice is there. You know, my friend Malik, we had so many great conversations, you know, and, and when we would end the conversation, I would always feel so much better about everything in my life. And I know he did too. Like we would just kind of, um, iron sharpens iron, you know, I would have more insights and, and feel more intelligent and feel more loved and honored and respected at the end of every conversation. And he did too. And it was just one of those things like, wow, And we lived so far away that we hadn't met yet. We were going to meet, but we had so many crazy things in common. And uh, my friend Cameron, he was another one of those very, and he's still alive. Thank you, God. But Malik died of just a a random brain aneurysm. Like we, we made contact. And then a couple days later, he was dead. That was it. We hadn't seen each other or talked to each other in months. Never seen each other, actually. Hadn't talked to each other in months. You know, but my friend from Algeria, he lives in New York now. And, um, he and I were talking the other day. We just, we don't talk a lot. We usually write each other and, um, but we just love each other dearly. He's like such a good friend and I could talk to him about anything. You know, he's like so open-minded and so open-hearted, you know? So that's on my list. What kind of friends do I want? People who are open-minded and open-hearted people that make me laugh. People that laugh at my jokes and get me. People that would be there for me at three in the morning. If I needed it. Not that I'll ever take advantage, but if I needed it. People that I don't mind being there for at three in the morning if they need me. People that I would be honored to be there for at three in the morning. You know, I've, I've got friends... Even in Arkansas, I've got friends that they were from other places. One of them's from um, California, and, and you know, we were the ones. You know, he's one that I did a lot of cool stuff with in the park. My friend Wayne, he's awesome. 
my friend Rainy, I just met her here in Cuenca, Ecuador, but um, she's from Minnesota, and that's where I grew up part of my life in Minnesota. So we have some strange things in common like about Minnesota, which I love. Cool state, really beautiful state. And, um, but there's like a different kind of culture there. And the people are very sweet. And there's like an innocence there you don't find in other places. I love that. And um, Rainy and I talk all the time. And her brother Jordan and I, he's like my best friend in Cuenca. And I met, I met her through Jordan. And her sisters live here. I love her sisters. Her whole family, they're like my extended soul family. Great people, you know. So I do, I'm grateful for the new people in my life. You know, and you, you will be too. You open up your mind and your heart and your life to the right kind of people, but write your list and and write a list of boundaries and what you don't want in friendships. And if anyone you meet that's new displays those, uh, those behaviors, the willingness to bust your boundaries right away. Sorry, baby, you're out. That's it. It's not baseball. You don't get three strikes. You get one get out. It's over. You know, if someone busts your boundaries, it's time to get them out of your life. You know, especially if they're like someone you're trying to formulate a friendship with and it's new. Anyway, that's it. That's the discussion for today about, um, you know, friendships and friendship goals, hashtag friendship goals, (laughs) you know, you also have to be friends with people who will forgive you if you mess up and people that you will forgive easily you know and if it's someone who's just horrible and they've treated you like crap you could still forgive them but you also don't need to ever invite them over for Easter dinner or Thanksgiving or Christmas or Saturday (laughs) you know you don't have to um You know, you don't have to remain friends with people who are treating you bad. And you don't have to continue friendships, new friendships with people just because you're trying to make it work because you're lonely. So you got to write down all things you want. I, I keep thinking, who would I want if I meet my twin flame and we're going to marry? Who do I want at my wedding? Who do I want to share this deep, powerful moment with at my wedding. You know, and the people that I think, well, I don't know if I want them there. I don't know if I could trust them there in that setting (laughs) to not embarrass me. Or I don't know if I could trust them for other reasons. Like, you know, so if it's, if it's a question of would I be embarrassed of having them there or it, would I, you know, if you start getting hemming and hawing in your mind about someone, then you have to reevaluate that friendship. But if you think about who, you know, like, okay, if my, I, and I always think, okay, if my twin flame is the celebrity, the person I think he is, which I'm pretty sure he is, but if that's him, how many of my friends are going to clamor to be at that wedding to meet him? and his friends who are also celebrities, right? And how embarrassed would I be if they were using me just because they want to get to that celebrity, that famous thing, you know? So, and I think about that too, like, huh, maybe those people aren't my friends because I think they would suddenly glom onto me again, even though they've kind of dwindled in their conversations over the past few years with me if they found out I was marrying that person you know so I think about that too so even if that's not your situation or circumstance what if (laughs) you became best friends with the most famous person in the world how many of your friends would suddenly reevaluate and want to be in your life again right like to use you to get to something better and, and, and then that idea, that was another whole level of it. Like, okay, yeah, but right. Maybe those people aren't really my friends and I need to reevaluate those uh, friendships as well. Anyway, that's, uh, that's my, 
it's my two cents worth. Uh, I have a <clears throat> mini familiar report today. She's downstairs sleeping right now. She did not feel like coming upstairs. She was sleeping on the chair. We're, we've been bombarded, by the way, I, for hours. I was going to start this show an hour before I did, but I just, it's like I couldn't even see straight because of all the crazy, um, all of the crazy energy I was feeling suddenly out of nowhere. I was feeling very dizzy. My eyes were blurry. Tinnitus has been just off the charts all day. Um, kind of the, um, gassy tummy bloaty thing has been happening, which is super annoying. Um, in spite of my eating uh, vegetarian food for several days and, you know, trying to eat healthier, even my snacks, my God, even my snacks are like freaking nuts and rice cakes and, you know, healthier things. And I'm eating, uh, the only bread I've eaten is this amazing sourdough that I get locally sourdough, um, bagels and, and sourdough, by the way, if you don't know, the ingredients are water and flour. That's it. The yeast and the bread, it grows naturally from the wheat and it's, um, sourdough is sour because of the yeast, but because it's allowed to, um, ferment, it actually has a lot more protein from the yeast which is pretty incredible because it also has last lactobacillus acidophilus and a bunch of other things that's good for your tummy and for your gut health. And I've been eating a lot of good stuff for gut health and I'm still having issues and I don't understand, but I'm working on it. And so I know that it, but when I look at all the symptoms that other people list it, this is the symptoms and I was feeling very tired. I was feeling kind of woozy, a little bit, a slightly nauseated and, um, almost like kind of off kilter, not able to function with my limbs very well. My legs got very swollen today. uh, So a lot of the swelling, um, holding on to water weight, being mentally foggy, not clear, a little bit out of it. Um, Heart palpitations, throat chakra issues. Although my cat over the weekend laid across my, my, um, she laid across my uh, throat and purred for hours, and that seemed to fix it. She's a little healer, man. She's been she's been healing me all kinds of ways, but she's also a cat burglar. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you how. This morning, she attacked my ear and bit my earring and stole the diamond out of it. It wasn't really a real diamond, but it looked real. And I've, and I've been wearing the same earring for like two or three years. My son bought, bought it for me. And, um, it was just, you know, a little cheap earring, you know, two, three dollars. And, um, but it was beautiful. It looked like real. And I, I think my cat ate the diamond out of it. (laughs) I'm not going to sift through the litter box. I'm just going to throw it away. But I mean, totally crazy, right? She's a little cat burglar the nerve of her <laughs> she's doing really well she's happy today a little bit ornery but um, cuddled a lot today she's downstairs I expect in the middle of the night I'll hear from her again she usually comes up about midnight she'll come up and she'll get her violence out of the way <laughs> attacking my feet scratching my arm she, she's not very um she doesn't scratch too often, but she does a few times when she gets really feisty with her playing. And, um, but she's been very cuddly, very sweet. And when my stomach was hurting the other day, she actually laid next to my stomach and purred next to my stomach. So she knows her role as a healer. It's like really cool. I'm glad this cat came into my life. Anyway, so that's my familiar report. I drew our collective card of the day from the Everyday Witch Tarot. And today our card is the Six of Wands. I'm going to read that description for you right now. And actually, Pure Intention 555, um, in the past 24 hours, she put out a new list. I'm going to read her list of um, symptoms, uh, Ascension Flu symptoms. 
but six of wands is victory is sweet, but no one achieves success completely on their own. It's good to be recognized for our achievements. It's also good to be aware of how we got to where we are now. Everyone's proud of the witch in the picture. She has clearly done something momentous and she's been properly rewarded for her achievements. But you can tell that she's humble still. Maybe even a little uncomfortable with all the attention. This witch knows that she is a part of the community and that anything she does reflects at least as much on those around her as it does on her own efforts. She is pleased to be recognized, but finds just as much pleasure in sharing the moment with those who helped her get there in the first place. Things to consider. The Six of Wands, it's a sign that you're doing something right. You're soon going to be recognized for it, for your efforts. Hooray for you. Who should you be thanking for helping you? Or if this card refers to someone else in the reading, and maybe you'll be patting yourself on the back for aiding them in another, you know, or aiding in another person's achievements. Either way, the Six of Wands, it's always a positive indicator. So, huzzah. (laughs) Huzzah. Oh my God. That reminds me of Luke's sister on the Gilmore Girls. One of my all-time favorite shows. So, um, okay, I'm going to read this uh, little message from Pure Intention. I had it queued up, and now, of course, it's not um, not queued up anymore. Dag, now, but here we go. All right, got it again. Okay, energy update. Now, she did this 16 hours ago. Increased sensitivity to your surroundings. Food, smells, sounds, yeah, for sure. That's true. Feeling overwhelmed or overstimulated. Joints, back and shoulder aches. Throat and heart palpitations. Dizziness and spaciness. Crown activations and downloads with headaches. Temple pain. Moving side to side still. Uh, Oh, the pain moving side to side. I'm like, I'm not moving side to side. Are you? Okay, no, that's not what she meant. Um, Some people are experiencing migraine headaches at this time. Tingling, pressure, and solar plexus, which is clearing out and having upset stomachs. Lots of ear ringing, kundalini heat, body temperature fluctuations, freezing cold to hot and sweating, purification of chakra systems, Again, as we align the new templates, lots of big body, big body vibrations. Again, that's pure underscore intentions, 555. She always puts the updates every few days. She is wonderful at this. Um, oh, I just looked and we had 5222, 52 minutes, 22 seconds. Um, so 222 is your angel number. And we have another one on space weather. Uh, Yeah, actually, I think it's 44. Because we had 44 fireballs over the United States. From NASA's All-Sky Cameras and the All-Sky Fireball Network. I'm going to start with this because 44 is a magical number. And I think it doesn't have something to do with angels helping you with your goals. And they're at your side. Just call upon them. I know 444 with three fours is thousands of angels are surrounding you at this moment, helping you and aiding you and protecting you. But 44 is a little bit different. But um, anyway, out of this, there were 24 sporadics, 12 Orionids, 4 Southern Towerids, 2 Leonides Minorids, 1 Epsilon Geminid, and 1 Oct Beta Camelopardalid. I think they're just making crap up. I've never heard of that, have you? Anyway, 44 fireballs over the United States. Current solar wind speed is 365.5 kilometers per second. We do have a sunspot, AR2776, which is crackling with minor B-class solar flares. We are also in a solar wind stream right now. 
and another one will be starting tomorrow and tomorrow we're going to be hit with a double whammy because the one we're being hit with right now is going the tail end of it will be tomorrow and then we get slammed once again tomorrow with more solar wind so um let's see we will be slammed with a high speed stream of solar wind and it's going to hit earth's magnetic field the 22nd and 23rd of this week we uh expect g1 class geomagnetic storms which is going to be beautiful for the aurora borealis of course and the gaseous material is flowing from a northern hole in the sun's atmosphere and bright auroras are going to be able to be seen in canada alaska and all the countries of scandinavia the orionids have arrived so you might want to go check out even on spaceweather.com there's a clip about this where there's a lot of meteors coming um streaking through the sky it's pretty darn cool this is a little uh photography from Mark Charon of Ayr Scotland and he got a fireball dis- disintegrating just below the hunter's sword in the constellation of the hunter so it's pretty cool um there's a rare view of the moon if you want to read this little article that's also on spaceweather.com right now and uh let's see the neutron counts 9.2% of the space age average which is high but this in the past 48 hours it's gone down by 0.9% so a little bit less um you know cosmic radiation coming our way we do have solar wind flowing from the network of corona holes which we mentioned yesterday that will be here tomorrow through the 25th so again that's there's two double whammies and you could just see right on the surface of the sun in this picture there's a lot of what looks like to be solar flares getting ready to pop off the sun there's three of them two are on the side but one massive one is facing us right now so don't be surprised if you know you have a little bit of internet issues as well as electricity cuz it looks a little bit uh strong so the shimon resonance from disclosurenews.it today was 66 hertz frequency that's bigger than normal and with heartmath.org we don't have today's numbers but we have from 2 days ago and again i had it all queued up and for some reason it's not so oh now all right now got to actually go back to the website i hate when that happens all right <laughs> anyway now i got to wait for a second here we go um now it's for some reason not loading correctly darn it oh here we go here we go all right now i i accidentally reloaded the page twice in a row <laughs> patience patience is a virtue all right here we go um All right. Uh da, 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 da. And this website is like the hardest one. It, it's a little hard to understand, but once you get it, it's good. All right. California was at 96 hertz frequency. This is October 18th on Sunday. Hafuf Saudi Arabia was at 0 hertz frequency. And Lithuania was at 104 hertz frequency. Alberta, Canada was at 136 hertz frequency. Northland, New Zealand was at 61 hertz frequency. And here's a nice number for your angel number exploration. 111. That's 111 in Hululului, South Africa. So there you have it. I'm going to take a quick break, guys. When I come back, 
I'm going to talk about Paul Foster Case. We haven't talked about him yet. He's one that started the mystery school, Builders of the Adatum, which you can find at bota.org. And I'll be right back after this message. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's high time you did. It is the absolute easiest way to make a podcast. First of all, it's absolutely free. Second of all, they have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. You guys have known that I've been doing this for eight months using the Anchor.fm app right on my cell phone, and I have done it everywhere, right? I have recorded this in my living room, my bedroom, little cafes in Quito, Ecuador, all over Cuenca. It's so absolutely easy to make your podcast and editing is just a snap. Anchor also will distribute your podcast for you. And it took me about two and a half months to become syndicated. And now I'm available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more and so can you you can make money from your podcast also and there's no minimum requirement you get paid from your very first listener it is everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place so please if you are interested in making a podcast of your very own do not hesitate to start with anchor Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. All right, guys, I'm going to talk to you about Paul Foster case tonight. Now, I have mentioned many times about the builders of the Adytum, A-D-Y-T-U-M, which is the temple not built with hands. And this is what my father told me on his deathbed. He said, I've been building that damn temple for weeks now, and I want you to know I'm finally finished. And I'm like, what? He says, you know what I mean. That damn temple, I had to build it but without my hands. And I, my dad was a 32nd degree Mason, so I, I only knew because of Paul Foster case that he had brought up this, <laughs> this concept and is pretty much building up your spiritual life. And we're going to talk about the mysterious and spiritual life of Paul Foster case tonight. I was first introduced to this man from my uh, husband of 13 years. He had many of his books and he had studied the in the Western Mystery School that Paul Foster Case started called Builders of the Adatum or B-O-T-A dot org, BOTA dot org, O-R-G. In the event that you want to take these lessons, they are incredible. And if you do them correctly, um, you will get a lot of insights and you'll learn a lot about, um, well, the Holy Tarot and the Kabbalah and all of it. So I'm going to read to you from the Wikipedia page a little bit. And I have a couple different websites I've gotten, including Amazon has a list of all the books he's ever written. And when just hearing the titles of these books, you're going to be impressed with this guy. And so I want to encourage you, if you're interested, uh, to possibly um, uh, get one or two of these books and start to research this on your own. If you decide to do the lessons, I think they're roughly around $12 a month. Most people can handle that. Uh, They will send the lessons to you anywhere in the world. And it's like once a week you get the lessons or once a month maybe. And there might be a way to download them now, but I don't think that they do that. I think it's just, you get them, you put holes in the side, you do like a hole punch 
and you put them in a notebook and you have to color your own tarot cards and this is how you build up your personality um and and he talks about what that really means and helps you to become a discerning individual and to only attract the highest vibration and the whole nine yards but he has the idea of um the the western mystery school concept it's it's different than the um eastern mystery schools where you sit in silence and meditate but with the western traditions a lot more activity because it's geared more towards the western mind which is is pretty cool i i liked it i did both i did the eastern school first and followed by the western school i never did finish the lessons in his mystery school and I might I might get back to it um soon and start start it from maybe from the beginning again at least getting the early lessons and just kind of reviewing them and then where I left off and you get to color your own cards but it takes a long time like you'll put one color in then you have to meditate on that sometimes for a month and then you do a second color and there's a reason for it So if you're patient with it, you're going to learn everything. But his uh mystery school can take well upwards of 20 or more years. But at the end you do have a PhD in metaphysics. So I I knew one person who got that degree and it was pretty cool. <laughs> I I was really proud of uh of her for having stuck with it. All right. So this is what the Wikipedia page says. He was born October 3rd, 1884. This is Paul Foster Case. His last name is spelled C A S E. And he died on March 2nd, 1954. He was an American occultist of the early 20th century and author of numerous books on occult tarot and Kabbalah. Perhaps his greatest contribution to the field of occultism were the lessons he wrote for associate members of Builders of the Adytum or BOTA. The knowledge lectures given to initiated members of the chapters of the BOTA were equally profound. Although the limited distribution has made them l- less well known, which and that's true and this is why i am going to tell you guys tonight about him because he's very very important figure um okay so let's go into his early life a modern scholar of the occult tarot and kabbala paul foster case was born at 5:28 p.m. oh we could do his astrology october 3rd 1884 in fairport new york his father was the town librarian and a deacon at the local congregational church. When he was 5 years old, his mother began teaching him how to play the piano and the organ. Later on in his youth, Case performed <laughs> I have you guys been, are you hearing my cat? R- r- she's racing all as fast as she can all over the bedroom. <laughs> oh my gosh, she is hilarious and she just threw something down the stairs and watched as it went down the stairs now she's looking for something else she could throw down the stairs <laughs> oh she's a holy terror today <laughs> she's re- being very funny but anyway um in case you hear a bunch of stuff ping-ponging off the walls that is actually the cat so just wanted to let you know <laughs> um so you don't think there's a ghost or something in here although if you hear a voice that's not a cat like voice it might be it very well be a, a fairy or or um maybe even a dragon i've got several beings that hang out with me quite often so we'll see anyways let's get back to this um so uh later in his youth case did perform as an organist in the family's church He was a talented musician. He embarked upon a successful career as a violinist and orchestra conductor. He had an honorary doctorate in music awarded to him. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. 
Case was early on attracted to the occult. While still a child, he reported experiences that today you would call lucid dreaming. He corresponded about these experiences with Rudyard Kipling. Oh, wow, that's right. They would have been alive at the same time. That's really interesting. I don't know if you guys recognize that name, Rudyard Kipling, but he wrote The Jungle Book. And he wrote a lot of other things. And he is an incredible author. If you ever have um, the inkling, I would highly suggest even, you know, going to a used bookstore and looking um, him up and grabbing one or two of his books. The Jungle Book is an incredible book. I read it to my um, oldest child when she was very, very young. And she loved it. She, When she was a baby, I read this to her, actually. I read to both my kids, but I read different stories to them. But, um, yeah, the Jungle Book. Wow. So, Rudyard Kipling, who was very spiritual, too, by the way. So, um, and Rudyard Kipling encouraged him as to the validity of his paranormal pursuits. Well, see, that's good. In the year 1900, Case met the occultist Claude Bragdon while both performing at a charity performance. Bragdon asked Case what he thought. Let's see, where do I just see? Um, what he thought the origin of playing cards was. So after pursuing this question in his father's library, Case discovered a link to tarot called the Game of Man. Thus began what would become Case's lifelong study of the tarot, and this led to the creation of Bota and the, the tarot deck, which Case called it the corrected version of the Rider Weight cards. That's true, and, and I'm going to tell you one of the secrets. In the... Um, Rider weight deck in the card, the fool. And I talked about this before it shows that the, the dog is nipping at the heel of the fool because it appears he's going to go off the edge of the mountain in the Paul Foster case version. He mentions in the lessons that you are, are us, you know, as you know, we are more, enlightened than we were when this was first made and the dog no longer needs to nip us at the heel and we we do have the sense not to fall off the mountain you know he's just going to the edge to get a better look and so the dog is our faithful and loyal companion and not our um guidance that's gonna you know bite us right so that was just one of the things that he changed and shifted ever so slightly and he he did change a lot of the imagery he wanted to make it as perfect as possible to help us achieve a higher greatness and i have a feeling that he was a spiritual master and even though that might not be mentioned anywhere i kind of feel like it's true so okay um We'll see, maybe it's mentioned in some of these. Because honestly, I don't know all there is to know about him. I just know a little bit. But so that's what the purpose of tonight is, is to learn more about him. So, uh, okay, Uh, where was I? Uh, All right, so between 1905 and 1908, when he was 20 to 24 years old, Paul Foster Case began practicing yoga, and in particular, pranayama, from what published sources were available at that time. His early experiences appear to have caused him mental and emotional difficulties and left him with a lifelong concern that occult practice is done with, or with a lifelong concern that so-called occult practices be done with proper guidance and training. See, I agree. I really agree with it. I love the way he wrote the lessons. They're very well laid out. In the summer of 1907, Case read The Secret of Mental Magic (laughs) by, guess who? (laughs) Rama Charaka, also known as William Walker Atkinson. Now, if you've been with me for a while, you know we've read several of his books already on the show. 
he was big time occultist back in the turn of the century, <laughs> the turn of last century. Um, so this led him to correspond with the then popular new thought author. And many people speculated that Paul Foster case and William Walker Atkinson were two out of the three anonymous authors of guess what? The last book we read and finished the Kaiba Lion. So yeah, I feel a few of you are going to be connecting the dots on that one. Yeah. The Kaiba Lion was written by possibly William Walker Atkinson, who I was speculating, but they also believe is Paul Foster case as well. Two out of the three. So (laughs) this is an influential philosophical text. Although the introduction to the edition of the Kaiba Lion released in 2011 has presented considerable evidence for Atkinson as the book's lone author. I don't think so. I mean, it's three initiates and I feel like, I mean, I told you guys, it's like a portal and I left my body and I went up the first time I tried to read this book, you know, 20 years ago. And just when I read it to you guys, the same thing happened. I left my body and I went and there was like a a marble table, a round table and there were the three initiates and they were wearing these hoods that were so big that it obscured their faces and they just kept pointing to a text that was ancient looking and on the slab I mean the Kaiba Lion says the Kaiba Lion says this and the Kaiba Lion says that so the book itself the Kaiba Lion seems like it's a book talking about another book that no one knows what it is or where, it at, where it's at but when I left my body, I saw the original Kaiba Lion. So I know there are three of them. I know it's true. So that's interesting. Says that though. So he had a dilemma at one point, whether he was going to go towards music or the mysteries, but luckily for us, he went towards the mysteries So, uh, let's see. Case reported a meeting on the streets of Chicago in 1909 or 1910 that was to change the course of his life. A Dr. Flood, F-L-U-D-D, a prominent Chicago physician, approached the young case, greeted him by name, claimed to have a message from a master of wisdom, who the doctor said, is my teacher as well as yours. The stranger said the case was being offered a choice. He could continue with his successful music career and live comfortably, or he could dedicate himself to serve humanity and thereby play a role in the coming age. Y'all know what age that means. That's where we're at now. (laughs) So the builders of the Adidam for over a hundred years have been there you know, uh, to help people usher in literally the new age that we're in the process of initiating into our world right now. So from that time on case began to study and formulate the lessons that served as the core curricula of the builders of the Adidam, the school of tarot study and Kabbalah that case founded and that continues today. In 1916, Case published a groundbreaking series of articles on the tarot keys called The Secret Doctrine of the Tarot. In the popular occult magazine at the time called The Word, uh, the articles attracted wide notice in the occult community for organizing and clarifying what previously had been confusing and scattered occult doctrines about the meaning of the tarot cards yeah his his uh, books are really incredible um so in 1918 paul foster case met michael james witty who died on the 27th of december 1920 in los angeles california and he was the editor of azoth magazine Oh, that's crazy. You know what? My, um, my ex-husband, 
um, had a book or a series of little tiny magazines in a box. He had a lot of books. I mean, we had 11 cases, bookcases of um, books, floor to ceiling, and very deep. So it was almost like some of the bookcases fit several rows of books deep, as well as up, you know, like in every direction. I mean, that's that was what our house was. It's all we did. We would read at night. We'd watch Frasier or listen to Art Bell. But during the day, it's all we did: read, read to the kids, read to each other read to ourselves and then discuss ideas. It was awesome. It was really awesome. <laughs> I really, really miss that life. <laughs> it was a good lifestyle to have, but you know what? Now I'm here to spew the information that I learned back then. So that's why I'm here now to serve humanity, to help you guys with your understanding of spiritual stuff. So anyway, um, where were we? So, uh, Oh, yes, but that's what I was going to say about the Azoth magazine, is that my husband had a box of old magazines that were metaphysical, turn-of-the-century magazines and little booklets. And Azoth was... He had several of those that were from his grandmother, who also studied the occult. And I had dreams of her where we were lay druids. We knew how to discern um, what herb was for what ailment. We did it by sight, but also by touch. We touched the plant, and the plant would tell us they were spirit teachers. And that was his grandmother. And she collected this Azoth magazine, so very, very interesting. Okay. So anyway, this so this guy, um, Michael James Whitty, the editor of Azoth magazine, became a close friend to Paul Foster Case. So Witty was serving as the Cancellarius or the treasure office manager for the Tho- the Thoth Hermes Lodge in Chicago, which is one of the lodges of the Alpha A Omega or the AO. <laughs> I remember the TV show The OA, Original Angel. Watch it if you haven't seen it on Netflix, it'll blow your mind. It's about what we're all going through right now. Anyway, Alpha et Omega was the successor organization to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which was founded in 1906 by S.L. McGregor Mathers. After the demise of the Golden Dawn in 1903, um, you might have heard of the Golden Dawn if you've ever heard of Aleister Crowley. So now that's falling into place a little bit, a little bit there, okay? (laughs) So Witty invited Case to join Thoth Hermes, which was a direct American lodge under the AO Lodge, Mother Lodge in Paris. Case joined and quickly moved up initiations through the Rosicrucian grades. And he wrote a book called The True and Invisible Rosicrucian Order. Case's aspiration name in O in AO was Perseverantia, which means perseverance. Would he republish Case's attribution of the tarot keys with the corrections in the Azoth magazine? The same year, Case began the sub premonstrator or assistant chief instructor at the Thoth Hermes Lodge. Also during that year, he finished a set of articles on the mystical Rosicrucian origins of tarot. I mean, a Faust, Faust, F-A-U-S-D, Faust. So the mystical Rosicrucian origins of Faust and published by Witty. The following year, he began to correspond to Dr. John William Brody Innes. Now, uh, between the uh, 1919 and 1920, Case and Michael Witte collaborated in the development of the text, which would be later published as the Book of Tokens, which is a great book, by the way. This book was written as a received text 
whether through meditation, automatic writing, or some other means. So a received text from spirit. It later resurfaced that Master R was the source of was the source, sorry. On May 16th, 1920, Case was initiated into Alpha et Omega's second order. Three weeks later, according to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn's bio page on Case, he was named the third adept. In the December of 1920, Michael Witte died. Case believed Witte's health problems were attributable to the dangers that arise or may arise in the practice of Enochian magic. Later, he corresponded with Israel Rigardi about those concerns. So he had a controversy with Mo- Moina Mathers. So like his fellow British occultist and later correspondent, Dion Fortune, oh, she is excellent too, by the way. She is all kinds of knowledge. She was in, an incredible writer about the tarot as well. We had books by her too. <laughs> so, um, Case found himself in a controversy with Moyna Mathers, just like Dion Fortune had. In 1865 to 1928, I think that's how long Moyna Mathers lived. So they had a controversy in the early 1920s. Perhaps because of the quick advancement through the grades of the order, Case sparked jealousy among the other adepts. Moreover, others might have thought some of his teachings inappropriate. On the 18th of July, 1921, Mathers wrote Case regarding complaints she had received regarding some of his teachings. Apparently, Case had been discussing the topics of sexual symbolism. Ooh, in 1920, that's crazy. I mean, now that'd be nothing. In 2020, eh, but a hundred years ago, that's kind of a big deal, actually. So, uh, so he had been discussing the topics of sexual symbolism and sex magic, which at the same time had no official place in the order's curriculum. Since no knowledge le- lectures exist on the subject, whether sex practices were ever taught in the Golden Dawn has been a long-standing question. In her correspondence with Case, Moina wrote, I have seen the results of the superficial sex teaching in several occult societies, as well as in individual cases. I've never met with one happy result. (laughs) We can only guess what she means by that. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. (laughs) Arsenio Hall's face pops into my head. Okay. But to Case, sexuality had become increasingly important as a subject. In his Book of Tokens, a collection of inspired meditations on the 22 tarot keys of the major arcana, Case comments on the sex function. You must wholly alter your conception of sex in order to comprehend the ancient wisdom. It is the interior nervous organism, not the external organs, that is always meant in phallic symbolism. And the force that works through these interior centers is the great magical agent, the divine serpent fire, which I personally call the kundalini energy. Ha! (laughs) The divine serpent fire, yes. In his works, the true and invisible Rosicrucian order and the Masonic letter G, he writes of certain practices involving the redirection of the sexual force to the higher centers of the brain, where experience of supersensory states of consciousness becomes possible. 
that's that's interesting, right? Some members also complained about a personal relationship between Case and a soror called Lily GC. Uh, G, I mean, yeah, G, E I S E. Maybe Gacy or GC? I don't know. Lily, we'll call her Lily. Case confessed the matter to Moina. The Hierophantria and I were observed to exchange significant glances over the altar. During the mystic repast, my conscience acquits me. Our relationship to each other, we submit to no other. Judge then that Lord of love and justice whom we all adore. In time, Case married uh, Geisy, maybe? G... E I S E. Geisa? Geisa? You Geisa? I don't know. Who died a few years later? Oh, that's so sad. Perhaps Moina's correspondence also touched a sensitive area after case. In a 18th of July dated letter, she tells Case Evidently, you have reached a point in your mystical way where there would appear to exist certain crossroads. The artist in you, which I recognize and with whom I deeply sympathize, would probably choose to learn the truth through the joy and beauty and physical life. She continued, You who have studied the pantheons, do you know of what enchanting god, the Celtic Angus, the ever young, he is sometimes called Lord of the Land of Heart's Desire. Angus rescued Etan, the moon, who had been turned into a golden fly. But Etan had to choose between bodily existence and the land of mortals and everlasting life. So she continues still. The artist in me has many has may sorry the artist in us may have lingered in that land for a moment but you and I who would be teachers and pioneers in this purgatorial world must be prepared because all the gods will be servants of the greatest of them all the Osiris the Christ the God of the sacrifice of the soul I mean, sacrifice of the self. Moina then asked Case to resign from his position as premonstrator. So Case resigned as premonstrator, responding to Mona, I have no desire to be a teacher and power in this purgatorial world. I, so I have no desire to be a teacher and pioneer in this purgatorial world. Guidance seems to have been to have removed me from the high place to which I have never really aspired. The relief is great. Apparently, Case had begun work on establishing a mystery school of his own, the School of Ageless Wisdom, which later became Builders of the Adidam. All right, so I'm going to stop this part of the reading because I wanted to just I wanted to get into some of the books he's written um see if we could get to that list it's it's a huge list especially when you look at the nature of the books themselves all right so these are just some titles on Amazon tarot interpretations tarot meanings The True and Invisible Rosicrucian Order. Esoteric Keys of Alchemy. Esoteric Secrets of Meditation and Magic. The Early Writings. Tarot Card Meanings Fundamentals. Tarot Fundamentals Tarot Symbolism. The Tarot, A Key to the Wisdom of the Ages. 
Hermetic Alchemy, Science and Practice, The Golden Dawn Alchemy, Series 2. Highlights of a Highlights of Tarot booklet. Oh yeah, oh, I love this book. It's a little tiny booklet. It'll tell you everything you need to know, though, about the tarot cards in a very compact form. You could get these at uh, bota.org or probably, well, now, actually, you can get it from, obviously, uh, Amazon. Book of Tokens, Tarot Meditations by Paul Foster Case. Occult Fundamentals and Spiritual Unfoldment, Volume 1, The Early Writings. The Great Seal of the United States, Its History, Its Symbolism, and Its Message for the New Age. That's really wild, man. An Introduction to the Study of the Tarot. Wisdom of Tarot, the Golden Dawn series book one. Tarot card meanings and interpretations, Tarot revelations, the Golden Dawn series two. So you could see that, I mean, this man was prolific as a writer, all the different things he wrote. So lots of stuff about Tarot, Tarot and Astrology, the Masonic letter G, I've read that. I highly recommend for you guys to read that. The Masonic letter G. It's um, very interesting. A collection of writings related to occult, esoteric, Rosicrucian, and Hermetic literature. The Wheel of Destiny, the Tarot Reveals Your Master Plan which is, of course, your destiny. Seven Steps in Practical Occultism, Law of Attraction. Whoops. So, yeah, Law of Attraction Techniques. So that's Seven Steps in Practical Occultism. I've actually taken that in the lessons. He does talk about that at length for quite a while. So then we got some stuff in other languages, looks like either Netherlands or possibly Germany, like German. He wrote a book called The Name of Names, Yeheshua. I keep trying to go back to these books, and I realize I I don't speak that language. I can't read them. The Name of Names, Yeheshua. Yeah, I remember my husband reading that and just going very philosophically deep for months after. Okay. I'm still looking to find ones in English. So, yeah, the name of names, Yeheshua. Brief analysis of the tarot, key to the wisdom of the ages. Introduction tarot. And the tarot, a key to the wisdom of the ages. That's a that's a good book, actually. So you kind of get the idea. I mean, there's like 69 different books here on Amazon. So, um, all right. I'm going to check our time here. All right. So, uh, now I'm going to go to masonrytoday.com. So this is, uh, kind of an online, I'd like to call it a zine, but just, I guess you could call it a blog that is put out for masons by masons. And this is what they say today in Masonic history, which this was published on the 3rd of October because that's Paul. Foster Case's birthday. So, today in Masonic history, Paul Foster Case is born in 1884. And Paul Foster Case was an American occultist. And and, um, he was born in Fairport, New York. At the age of five, his mother began to teach him piano. 
growing up, he played at the pianos, the, the family's church. And he had a great uh, talent for music and soon picked up the violin. In his youth, he began the fascination with the, with the occult. Sounds like me, too. <laughs> I was fascinated with anything wild and out there. <laughs> so... Allegedly, as a child, he had instances of what is now called lucid dreaming. So some of this information seems like it's kind of a little bit revitalized from Wikipedia. So let's see. Um, Most of the stuff you already know because I just told you. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Yeah, he that's when he started doing yoga that that's when he said you can't do occult practices without proper training. I agree. And guidance for sure. That's why, um, master Doriel in over in Colorado builders of the white or brotherhood of the white temple, BWT. That was his mystery school. And he would teach people how to raise their Kundalini right away. But he also did, uh, warn that if you're not ready to do it, don't do it. I mean, because he witnessed it. Even where he lived, he would teach people. And he saw one woman, the energy, the kundalini raised as high as her belly button. And she got scared. And it just went back down and went shooting back down so hard because she blocked herself from the third chakra. And it went all the way into the center of the earth. And she was tethered there. And she was mentally ill the rest of her life just she just basically went crazy and had to live the rest of her life in an asylum so when you hear someone say there's a warning with this occult practice just because it's okay for us to bring it out into the open in a more public forum now doesn't mean that kundalini energy is completely and totally safe to the uninitiated you have to become an adept you know like a student and study this and practice and learn like when I raised my kundalini it was spontaneous because most of the spiritual masters and people that are heavily into the occult they say it's better if you just let it raise on your own on its own it will come when it's time when you're ready and I was having a near-death experience when my kundalini raised. Sometimes it, it forces, um, it's forced out of necessity. I was having a health crisis. I was dying of asthma. The kundalini raised and the pot kicked in. <laughs> I had smoked some weed. You know, cannabis um, opened up my lungs. I was able to cough up what was holding me back from breathing. It was in my lungs. I'd gone to the doctor the day before and he refused to give me the medicine I needed. And I said, I I know I need this. And if I don't get it, I'm not going to make it. I I mean, my my fingers, my fingernails and my feet, you know, my toes were, was blue. I only lived at 3000 feet elevation. So I knew it wasn't that, but I knew I needed to be on prednisone. He refused to prescribe it. And so, (laughs) The next day, my body started to die. I looked in the mirror. My aura was gray. I knew I was going to die. Said goodbye to my six-month-old baby, and I just kind of tried not to cry, but I told my husband, I'm dying right now, so I love you. And he says, okay, meditate. Just meditate. You know, you want to leave consciously. And I'm like, okay, that's right. So I smoked some weed, and I just sat and meditated and cried. My kundalini rose spontaneously. Then the aliens appeared, and all this kind of wild stuff happened. It was a very strange day. <laughs> and that was a massive awakening for me, huge awakening. But he's right when he says this. You, you can't just fool with it. You can't just force a kundalini to raise, you know. You can't force spiritual growth on yourself. You can force yourself to sit down in, in, in a chair <laughs> You know, sit your butt down and read the books, do the meditation, but you can't force the growth. The growth comes as a result of doing all the things that you do to spiritually grow. 
but I've, I've learned over the years, I've learned a lot from Paul Foster case. So, um, it is believed that the builders of the Adenum was first in Boston. I did not know that because later he moved the school, of course, to Los Angeles. In fact, the building he started it in it, that's exactly where it is still. It's, it's still in the exact same building. And I've been in that building many, many times. In fact, when you walk in to the church part or the temple part of this building, the floor is black and white. And there was an energy there that was incredible. And when my husband and I walked, we walked into this place and I'm like, I'm getting a weird feeling, man. I'm getting a very strange feeling about this place. And I feel like I was feeling the spirit of Paul Foster Case there. It was his energy. I don't think he was a ghost, but it was his energy was imbued heavily in this place. And we walked in and I stood, we stood on this black and white floor and the, the, the squares were really big and it looked like the floor in several of the tarot cards. And it started to freak me out a little bit. I started to panic because before I ever went there, my husband said, it was right before we got married, actually, we were living together. And he said, you know, I'm going to take you over to the builders of the Adam temple. You're going to be amazed at this place. You know, the energy is very different than self-realization fellowship. And I said, okay, good. I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be cool. And the day before we went, I was on a, oh, I can't remember. I think, I think it was on a Thursday, actually. Because then we came back for that Sunday, and they had a Sunday service. Which I, it just was surreal. <laughs> Being there was surreal. Okay. And, um, let's see here. Let's see how much time we have here. Uh, so I can tell you the story. So, okay. This was my dream. We went in my dream. We went into like a, a living tarot card and I was standing on a white square no, actually, he was standing on a white square. I was standing on a black square, like a checkerboard or a chessboard, but black and white. Like in, I think, the High Priestess card. But several of the tarot cards have black and white squares. And I looked at him, and he looked at me. And we looked up, and the ceiling opened up. And as the ceiling opened up, it was a blue sky with white puffy clouds. Remember, this is the dream that I had right before I ever went to the building that Paul Foster Case created. And all of a sudden, I saw the uh, lightning bolt from the tower card come down. And this, it was like, it was like it was hand drawn or painted. And it came and it touched me. Kind of touched me in the shoulder. And then all of a sudden lightning bolts started shooting out, but it looked just like they had been drawn. Started, you know, just like directly from a tarot card. And they had shot out from my husband and I in every direction. And we turned and we were like holding hands, but only one hand. And it was just like the lover's card. So it, so it was like my dream was like all the tarot at once, almost, you know, like many different symbolisms from all the different cards. And then I heard a big booming voice of God through the, you know, the ceiling that had disappeared and became the sky and in a ray of sunshine, like the sun card, <laughs> the big booming voice of God, he said, your actions will affect thousands. And I knew that I'd made the right choice in being with him. You know, the the father of my children. So, (laughs) 
in the uh, room in my in my dream, over to the left and the right, there were um, red curtains. They're very rich and like dark, like a maroon red, which is like several of the um, tarot cards, including the chariot card in the uh, Paul Foster case version of the tarot. In the chariot, there he has curtains in his chariot. It looked very much like the curtains in my dream. And curtains are play a, a, a pretty big role in a bunch of different um, cards in the tarot. So basically I woke up from that dream and I just looked at him and I'm like, you're not going to believe the dream I had. That was some kind of wild. And we went the next day. So it was on a Thursday. I had the dream. We went on a Friday because there wasn't a whole lot of people around. And, and my husband said, well, we'll come back Sunday because that's when they have their Sunday services kind of like church, but it's like Kabbalah and tarot services. It's pretty freaking cool. And once you get, um, you can only go to the services if you are, um, studying the, the, the tarot, you know, through the school, you have to be a part of the mystery school to be invited into the building even. And when I showed up at first and I wasn't a part of it at all, but I was a spiritual seeker and I had to fill out a form saying I'm interested in taking the lessons. So I was able to participate. So when I first got into the building, he says, let's go to the place where they have the services. And it was a lot like my dream. There was a black and white floor, just like in my dream. And when we walked in, and we stopped and we're looking around and then I looked down and I was standing on a black square. My husband was standing on a white square and we were in the exact same position of my dream. And I got all kinds of freaked out because, oh my God, this was my dream. And here it's coming true. And I started looking around, seeing all the symbolism, like, whoa, I mean, I even looked at the ceiling and it was normal. Didn't open up. There was no heavens. There was no, uh, lightning striking me like from the tower. But when my husband and I, uh, a year before I filed for divorce, I was struck in that same exact shoulder by lightning, just like in my dream. So that was pretty trippy. And since then I've been able to hear the voice of God, (laughs) just like in my dream, you know, the big booming voice of God, you know, talking to me, but now we have conversations, but it's, I don't hear it as a big booming voice. It's not coming out of the sky, but a lot of those, like that dream was very symbolic. I have a feeling Paul Foster case was a real master. I have a feeling he gave me that dream so that I would be interested in being a part of his mystery school for a while to fulfill my destiny, which is to have this show for you guys. So it's all pretty trippy. It's all very cosmic. And the first, we went back on a Sunday and we saw the builders of the Adidam um, discussion of the day was the judgment card. And that's what the ceremony was just talking about, the judgment card. And then all of a sudden everyone broke into this chanting of this I didn't know what it was, a prayer or a poem. I was like, what the hell? What the hell? It was like starting to freak out. But it was a thing called the pattern on the trestle board that he also wrote. In fact, let me uh, let me look that up right now and I'll read that and that'll be the end of the show because that's something that is very important. And I for- totally forgot until right this minute, so bear with me as I look this up pattern of the trestle board T R E. Yeah, here we go. (laughs) T R E S T L E B O A R D. And this is directly relating the Kabbalah, the tree of life. So here we go. Um, 
this is what we, my husband and I read, or we, well, we memorized it, and then we said this to our children every night as they fell asleep. So this would be a part of their subconscious mind, and because it's a good foundation. A trestle board is what you build to build a boat. You know, and so it, you know, it's like a, it's like a trestle board. You, it's like the framework, your foundation upon which you build everything else. And so we wanted our children to have a very strong, solid occult foundation that would help them in life, whether they're aware of it or not. So here it is. This is what we read to them: the pattern on the trestle board. This is truth about the self zero all the power that ever was or will be is here now one I am a center of expression for the primal will to good which eternally creates and sustains the universe two through me its unfailing wisdom takes form in thought and word three Filled with understanding of its perfect law, I am guided moment by moment along the path of liberation. Four, from the exhaustless riches of its limitless substance, I draw all things needful, both spiritual and material. Five, I recognize the manifestation of the undeviating justice in all the circumstances of my life. Six, in all things, great and small, I see the beauty of the divine expression. Seven, living from that will, supported by its unfailing wisdom and understanding, mine is the victorious life. Eight, I look forward with confidence to the perfect realization of the eternal splendor of the limitless light. Nine, in thought and word and deed, I rest my la- I rest my life from day to day upon the sure foundation of eternal being. Ten, the kingdom of spirit is embodied in my flesh. So. Okay, now it does say here, all this is a copyright material by builders of the Adidim, of course, and can only be used by other publications or websites with express permission. Well, I'm saying it out loud. I'm not actually. So, but you can go check them out, B-O-T, B-O-T-A dot org. And they talk about all the different things, regional activities, membership, um, news and events, resources, online store, everything. They also have the Emerald Tablets of Hermes. And that is, of course, also known as Thoth the Atlantean. And this is what ties Paul Foster Case to Master Dorio. Um, the fact that he puts this out here. But they have fun stuff on their website. The Gematria Calculator, the Global Healing List, the Open Door, which is their um, little publication they put out. And my cat just jumped on the bed, and she's telling me it's time to sleep. She She's purring, which means she's getting ready. <laughs> and she wants to let me know it's also time It's time for me (laughs) to. She wants to sleep. I could see it in her eyes. Hey, baby girl. How are you, Knowledge? Is it time for us to sleep, Knowledge Ravenspell? Ah, she blinked her eyes at me. That means yes, it is. So, all right. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Metaphysical Soul Speak, the podcast. I wanted to quickly mention a big thank you to those of you who have been um, liking, forwarding, subscribing, and telling everybody you know, including your followers and your people in your Facebook groups about the show, 
um, for whatever reason, I can't do it. I can't, um, I've tried. And then they say, you're not allowed to talk about yourself or your own endeavors on this group, but you could talk about other people's stuff. So if you guys feel the need to share the word, it will really help me out. And I want to thank you for that in advance. Several of you have sent in donations. I want to say thank you to those of you who have done that. You know who you are. Um, my PayPal is mermaidgirl888 at gmail.com or metaphysicalsoulspeak at gmail.com. So thank you for that as well. I love each and every one of you, and I'm grateful to have you on this spiritual journey with me. To find me on Twitter and also on Instagram, you could just look up hashtag soul tribe or hashtag soul family. Sometimes I do soul fam, F-A-M. I'm also at mermaidgirl888 on both of those, just so you know. Um, well, that's it. That's, that's all she wrote. I will be back tomorrow with all unique and original programming, just like always. And, um, well, there you go. <laughs> I'm signing off now with peace and joy and the high vibes of the holy fifth dimension. Until next time, guys, peace. Metaphysical Soul Speak is run on sponsors and listener support. This means listeners like you. If you are so inclined to support my efforts and my little podcast, please visit me at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and pledge an amount of your choosing today. Thank you.